I'm sorry, which session is this so I can pull up the PowerPoints? Does anyone know off the top of their head? Just this 40, Just this 40, thank you. 40 funding and how to energize your community. Uh, no, just this 40 initiative and community action. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll have you pulled up in just a second. And this this thing is just a little close to us. This screen. Pull your tables out. Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Leanne. I know Carrie and I are not the only two people on this panel. Where is everybody else? Everybody in the bathroom break. Okay. Or downstairs, like I was. Yeah. You know, once you finally get there, you can then start talking about other people. You know that, right? <laughs> once you finally show up. Okay, and I believe, Hi, don't we, isn't um Dr. Mitchell, I mean, um, yeah. Harold Mitchell? Um, he is on Zoom. Hi, sorry, I'm having trouble with the telephones. Could you come up here? Okay, so we're going to chat because uh, we're having some know. technological issues. Thank you. Brother Shabazz, yes, get on the other side of this table, please. Side of that side. This side. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I have had three cups of sweet tea. <laughs> and she was going to kick in. I'm just letting you know. Any moment now. Okay. We are going to have a dynamic conversation. I can promise you that because the people on this session are doing some amazing work. It says Dr. Wilson is going to be on this panel. Let's hope Dr. Wilson keeps his in the in the main room and just relaxes. Because I'm worried about him collapsing before the day is over. So this is a panel on the Justice for the Initiative and Community Action. Um, we have heard several entreaties already about Justice 40, but we're going to hear more about that and what does it look like at the application level. Um, during uh, President Biden's first, okay, my name is Bernie Smiley Travis. I just assume you all know that, and I'm just going to keep it moving. Um, during his first days in office, actually during his first afternoon in office, President Biden signed Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, that created a government-wide Justice 40 initiative with the goal of delivering 40% of the overall benefits of re relevant federal investments to disadvantaged communities. The Justice 40 initiative is unlike any commitment we have ever seen from the federal government with regard to the funding 
allocated to, in an attempt to address environmental racism. Many federal and state agencies have since provided a list of covered programs under this monumental initiative. I don't know how many of you all were listening online yesterday to the energy justice panel um, when Dr. Tony Reeves from the Department of Energy went on for about seven slides about all the different programs and funding under Justice 40 that the Department of Energy alone is going to move under this Justice 40 initiative. Many federal agencies, federal and state agencies have since provided this list of covered programs under this monumental initiative. Despite this groundbreaking commitment, it's fair to say that Justice 40 has its flaws. Notably, the Justice 40 initiative describes benefits, not direct investments for communities with environmental justice issues. And this vague language could prevent needed services and resources from reaching the intended recipients. In this session, our speakers will discuss state and community level implementation of Justice 40 challenges and flaws and the current framework. Now, you know Dr. Dr. Wilson wrote this because there's a whole nother half a page. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna cut this right here. So we can introduce our wonderful speakers. Bless his soul. Um, so our speakers on this panel um, are, uh, Dr. Wilson will not be here today, I'm hoping. I mean, you know, he won't be here in this room. Um, and Ms. Carrie Harris will discuss her um, uh, Mid-Atlantic Environmental Justice Coalition, of which I am a member, though Carrie will ma mark me a member and not get standing because I never show up for the meeting, but I swear, Carrie, I am a member. Um, and, she is based, uh, and she is also driving the Justice 40 pilot project for the Mid-Atlantic Environmental Justice Coalition. She's based in Dover, Delaware. Um, we will also hear from Mr. Jerome Sabaz, who will discuss his work in Philadelphia and provide his perspective on the EPA's role in providing support to communities to access infrastructure. And lastly, but not least, Mr. Harold Mitchell, who was going to be here with us in person, but was waylaid in South Carolina, and but will be participating. He will be participating, right, Shunning? Yes. He Thank you. He is on the line, and he did tell me to come upstairs via a text message. I'm waiting on the line. Y'all need to get this thing started. He said, as a founding member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, and as a former legislator in South Carolina and as the leading environmental justice voice in the state of South Carolina and the founder of Regenesis Incorporated, he will discuss the challenges with implementing Justice 40 at the national level and how his work with Regenesis can be replicated nationwide. And, so now, and as a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, I already said that, Marvin. EPA. Okay, girl, we ain't talking about EPA at this moment. I mean, we talk about their program, we're not talking about what he's doing. Um, so I have some. You got, some, you got um, plants in the audience already. <laughs> and this is exactly what I was doing in the previous session, okay? So you know I can't complain, right? But let me, let me say a couple things, my own thoughts about Justice 40. It is a monumental expansion of the imagination of what the federal government can do. Yeah. They didn't come up with this idea. We came up with this idea. We came up with this idea about 30 years ago. Okay, so it's taking them a minute to get to where we are. Um, but I want to say this about Justice, about um, President Biden and Kerry. Um, I hope you will agree with me, but you are from Delaware as Marvin <laughs> is from Delaware. And I have a slightly different perspective about President Biden. Um, in the interregnum between the election in 2020 and his swearing in in January of 2021, he was um, participating in a town hall. It was just him and a reporter on CNN. And the reporter asked him, I, I think it was Don Lemon, asked him, you seem to really have some passion about environmental issues and, and this sort of justice framework in particular. Why? And this is what President Biden said. Other people have paraphrased it today in other sessions, but I'm going to tell you what he actually said. He said that as the oldest child in his family, when they moved from Scranton to, um, to Delaware, to Wilmington, not Wilmington, Claymont, mm -hmm. um, it was his job that before his mother could pile them all in the car, before she could take off to drop them to school, it was his job to wipe down the window shield and wipe off the windshield wipers because there was a thin coat of oil every morning on their car windshield because they lived in a community with an active refiner. Wasn't a chemical plant, it was an active refiner. And he said 
Nobody has to tell me what it's like to live in a place when people do not care about the lives of the people who live in that community. And so, Carrie, I know I'm not on the ground in Delaware, and you are, um, but I just felt a, a deep sense of connection. I always liked him. But when he said that, I said, so we don't have to have any conversation about what environmental in inequity means. We don't have to have any conversation about the failings of the federal government and state government. We don't have to have that conversation. We could just go right into, and so what are you going to do? As the most powerful person in this country, the most influential policymaker, what are you going to do? And this is what he did on the afternoon that he was sworn in. He went back and signed 18 executive orders that between being, being um, sworn in and the festivities that evening, he signed 18 executive orders. And among those 18 was this executive order on climate justice and an executive order on advancing racial justice and equity across the federal government. Now, that's really great. I've worked really hard to get some of these executive orders with other presidents passed. But the, where the rubber hits the road is what do you do about it in terms of implementation? What are the appropriations? What is the money that you put behind it? Where are the staff that you put into it? And so we're gonna hear from our panelists about what this is starting to look like on the ground. But I will tell you that there are some speed bumps. There's a difference between a benefit and an investment. Yes, ma'am. Okay? A benefit, for example, could be the implementation of the Clean Air Act, right? Every jurisdiction in the United States without question has seen a market improvement in air quality because of the implementation of the Clean Air Act. Is the air where you breathe safe? Because we got the highest rate of death from COVID in the state of Maryland in Prince George's County, Maryland. Why is that? Because we're surrounded by highways. We're surrounded by heavy, heavy duty vehicles going back and forth across our streets. So, Maryland has seen benefit, but Prince George's County has not, and Baltimore City has definitely not. So there's a big difference between benefit and targeted investment to meet longstanding inequities and longstanding needs. And we're hoping that that's what Justice 40 is going to do. I'll be damned if Dr. Uh, Wilson is not here. We were hoping that you were going to stay downstairs. <laughs> We love you, Dr. Wilson, but you know. No, I just, you know. You're the hardest one. You already told us you don't want to work in man So we're going to hear from our panelists about what these challenges are, but also what the amazing opportunity is. But that opportunity can only be met if everybody steps to the front. And people do not try to play fast and loose with well, this is going to benefit, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. You got to have a damn boat, okay? You got to be able to swim. You got to not be surrounded by sharks and toxins and oil in the water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we ain't trying to hear about a rising tide lifts all boats. We want the investments in our communities. So we're going to hear from our panelists. I'm not actually a panelist, so you might not know that from all these comments I've made. Um, but we're going to start with Carrie. Carrie, bring us some wisdom. Is there a specific question you have? Oh, we have a question. Oh, Carrie, you have a question. Do you want a question? This is Carrie. Okay, okay, okay. Here's the question. What? So what do you see as the potential benefit? Um, an opportunity in the state of Delaware in terms of advancing Justice 40, and what are the impediments that have to be overcome? Absolutely. So first, let me, before uh, Dr. Wilson makes fun of me, I got a little stash of candies over here. Um, I'm a diabetic. I, I have allergies, and I cough. I don't have COVID. I tested it yesterday. I tested today here and at home, so I'm good. But my cough is not a, a pretty thing, so I'll be popping them. Let me do that because he, he messes with me all the time. Um, Justice Forty. I don't know if he's in here, but we have a champion in our state. His name is uh, State Representative Larry Lambert. Before he became our state representative, he was an organizer like most of us, working really hard in our community. Route 9 Corridor, he's a champion there. He is from Claymont. He now represents Claymont. He ran multiple times in primaries uh, to make sure that the people of Claymont have proper representation for people who not just said, I care about you, 
didn't just remember your name. And like I said, give you a, a nice smile and a firm handshake. But he felt that you had to be remembered in the halls of the places that are actually able to vote on those laws. And so he fought. And up and down the state, people know Representative Lambert because he's still been consistent to this day. One of the things that he did is make sure that we have a Justice 40 task force. And he fought hard against folks within his own caucus to say, we need community representation there. Uh, I am proud to say I was selected as one of the folks to be on the committee, as well as a woman named Maria Payan. She's in, at the symposium somewhere, uh, and uh, a number of other folks. But even that was a challenge. We're actually having conversations. But what comes from task force? More conversation. And Representative Lambert understands that, but at least we are now at the table. But what we are hoping is to generate in people excitement. People beyond just those who have been fighting for these for this moment for years. I work with an organization called uh, Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition of which uh, Dr. Wilson is a founding member. Bernice is also a member. And uh, we work in currently in D DC, Denver, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, and we hope to expand to our uh, sister states of Pennsylvania and West Virginia as our bandwidth opens up. But what does this mean? That means we connect across lines, that we're building community power together. See, one community at a time, one site fight at a time, they can divide and conquer. In my small state of Delaware, what does that mean? That means that even though we're three counties, if a legislator speaks to only one of us, they make it seem like, uh, well, if we help, we can only help you. We can't help everyone else. But now we're coming together and we say, wait a minute, we all have a similar problem. Maybe up north it's a refinery or residual effects of DuPonts dumping into our rivers and streams. Maybe in Cape County, it's CAFOs and the, and the Air Force Base and, and chemical plant. And maybe in our southern county of Sussex, maybe it's CAFOs and um, high volumes of traffic and um, ag farming that uses chemicals versus regenerative farming techniques. But what we do know is we have a common issue. Regardless of where you live, if you are black, brown, or poor white, you are forgotten. And so for the first time, people are seeing each other, not just within our state, but across the region. We're realizing, wait a minute, that same company is in my backyard. And we've been fighting them alone? The promise is in the idea that people who were here before us opened up a pathway and are only asking us to carry the torch. But carrying the torch is not just yelling again into the same spaces, but demanding that there is change because we now know our power. We're not satisfied with that nice smile and firm handshake. And we're voting in our own people. We need more Larry Lambert. And I'm thankful to know that in the state of Delaware, cycle after cycle, we're voting in more and more people who came from our ranks. And we're only a couple votes away from being able to have enough numbers to actually pass the legislation that changes the dynamic of our entire state. And we see each other. And so, just so y'all know, he has no idea embarrassing right now. That's State Representative Larry Lambert, the chair. Uh, um, and so that's the promise. But like every state, we have something called the Delaware way. Uh, you might have the Maryland way, the Virginia way. You name your state, you have the way where it's the powers that be who are trying to push against us. Um, but the change is going that's to come next. when we realize we're not just allow in the room. They don't have to welcome us. We should be in any room we've prepared ourselves to be in. And we know their game. We just play it better until we can change the rules. And we're getting closer and closer to changing those rules. So we just have to ignite people, get them excited, so we can maintain that power that changes our systems. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank you. Carol, can you hear us? Yes. Um, so the question, the question for you, Harold, is um, what are the challenges? So one of the things that people are concerned about about Justice 40 is that in democratic control states where there are democratic legislators, democratic governors, that we might actually see some traction. 
But in a state like South Carolina, where there's been consistent disregard for the interest of EJ communities, communities of color, tribal communities, low-income and immigrant communities, what are the challenges to implementing Justice 40 in South Carolina? And what is Regenesis and your partners going to do to try to make it happen there? <clears throat> well, uh, very first and foremost, you know that the political climate that we're in uh, right now, especially, uh, the thing people got to understand is that when the obstructionists, especially in the Republican Party, say that they want to destroy an administration, don't want to you know, see the successes like they did with President Obama with the uh, American Recovery Act. You know, in South Carolina before, we were denied the access and expansion of, of Medicaid. And that was one of the things that Nikki Haley did against uh, President Barack Obama. And, you know, we had rural hospitals that shut down, people died, and they were able to point the finger back to Barack and blame Barack. And so when I saw the whole thing with Justice 40 lining up, to me, it was deja vu. And if you're not ready, prepared, and we still have to do the work, uh, I knew the same thing was going to happen again, because there's a black woman laying in the flank, ready to become president. So we knew the anger that was there before about having a black man, but now you're talking about a black woman. So there's going to be, yes, resistance against that. And how, how can organizations like Regenesis and other partners or similarly situated organizations around the country, how can you push back against that? And how can you, how can you try and ensure that those federal resources actually reach communities on the ground. I'm thinking in particular, Harold, I'm thinking about um, uh, that community in Rock Hill that, um, that we were working with as part of that, cons that consortium and effort between DHEC and EPA Region 4. Folks who have lived in this community, historic Black community, has not had running water and sanitary sewage for decades. How are we going to make sure that they get what they need in Rock Hill? Okay. Well, Vernice, I will say this, though. I'm not trying to, you know, throw a wet blanket, but just the reality of what's there. Mm -hmm. But these members and folks in government, they're spinally challenged because no one's forcing, no one's holding anybody accountable. So who they're accountable to is the one, it's like the squeaky wheel getting the oil. Folks at the local level, they want the dollars and the resources. They're just afraid, you know, those that are up top, afraid of getting that opposition. So whoever positions themselves, builds a coalition and can align with the resources like we're working in Florida right now. Florida is just like South Carolina. Right now we have the reddest of red, I mean, uh, states there with uh, Def Sentence, the governor there, who is uh, <laughs> opposing everything there. And so we're working with them and aligning uh, Northport St. Joe, another community that's similar to South Carolina and we have the coalition that's set up to address the issues in their community where they had a community is basically built on top of an old paper mill with elevated levels of cyanide in the soils with no access to care whatsoever. So when we were able to look at the, uh, the covered programs in Justice 40 and seeing that this was a disadvantaged community, yes, those folks at the local level, they were wanting to see how they could get in line to draw those resources down for water, sewer infrastructure, and things of those nature to change the, uh, you know, what folks there were fighting with in the community. The only good thing about Justice 40 was the fact that coming out of the pandemic uh, with, you know, local governments and places that were shut down, everyone was kind of strained with resources. So this was an opportunity to uh, get some things done because of the you know, the plight where everybody was at at that particular moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Jerome, I'm coming to, need, to you next. Um, Philly is always thought of as a democratic stronghold, um, but there's been lots of neglect of communities of color historically. Um, and there is a, a battle, a Death Star battle going on in Pennsylvania right now about who is going to lead uh, the state government going forward. And one way or the other is going to greatly influence what happens with these federal resources and where they go. What are you all doing on the ground and what do you foresee as the landscape to advance Justice 40 in Pennsylvania and in Philly in particular? 
Well, thank you, Vernice, for the question, because Harold already sort of set the tone for it, that in these uh, political vestues, particularly at the state level, there's a great deal of hostility and historical opposition to any type of change. And Pennsylvania is no different. We're a former coal state. We're a big energy, old, dirty energy economy. And there's a great deal of policy around who gets resources, where dollars are being allocated. Even now, for example, some of the money that's being allocated or thought of as being uh, used in, 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 in some of the new budgets that are being uh, voted upon in the state are going to, to mining, mining countries, is going to abandoned wells, is going to agricultural regions where there's uh, acid runoff or nitrogen runoff. And so the, the question is not so much whether or not the state is getting resources, is who's getting those resources and who has access to those resources. So there's a great deal of challenge around not just the historical burden of, of communities of, of color and community of need, getting the resources, but it's the education around it and being incentivized to advocate for it, mm -hmm. to advocate for resources. So I'm looking at one of my colleagues, Adam Cutler, who's the chair of the state's environmental justice board, our EJAB. And we have a very cha a difficult challenge of even having the connection between how the state is gonna utilize its resources when received from the federal government, mm -hmm. to have a very cogent idea as to how it's used, what the standards are, what the priorities are, and how are you gonna measure who are those allocations are being provided for. Mm -hmm. Those things are not clear cut. So being able to work simultaneously with having the model for EJ40, but identifying how it's gonna be applied on the ground is an important part of the work that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Now I'm also, the chair of the Citizens Advisory Council, which makes recommendations for our Energy Equality Board. And I know how people advocate for regions that aren't in urban settings. And so therefore, there's a great deal of work that needs to be done around who's advocating, what we're advocating for, educating people to know that they have rights, and to realize that these resources are gonna be spent, not necessarily spent on you. Good point. Um, and I'm going to want to circle back to this in our conversation, but um, Dr. Wilson, I want to ask you, there are several layers that people are trying to work on this issue. There's a federal layer, and I think you and I work on that level. There's the state layer. There's the local government layer. What are we doing at the federal level or what are we attempting to do in this conversation to create an open up space for people to get what they need and what they're entitled to under Justice for it? Thank you, Sit up. I fall asleep up here. Okay. Thank you for that question, Bernice. Yeah, if you think about, uh, thanks, sir. If you think about, you know, the action at the federal level, of course, many of you are familiar. As part of uh, uh, Executive Order 14008, we have the WEJAC, right? So the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. So you have a lot of uh, EJ uh, advocates and activists who are part of that council. And I, uh, in our day two open plenary, we had three members, founding members of that council. Peggy Shepard, um, uh, Dr. Beverly Wright, and Dr. Robert Bullard, uh, who spoke about you know their work and you know funding the EJ movement and and, and reflected on that work on WeJack. WeJack, I think, just came up with some recommendations right recently yeah. uh, in yeah. the implementation of Justice Forty. So I think what needs to happen is so you have the work of WeJack, right? I'm also an ex official member of NEJAC, uh, NEJACs, and also he's an active member i'm ex official so i get to say something but it don't really count anymore but i was on knee for about six years but it's fine jerome helms it but I, and, and, and so we're working right now i can talk about this right we're working right now to submit a letter to the administrator about how they're going to uh deal with uh so our work group let me be clear our work group is the, uh, the justice 40 and finances work group mm -hmm. so we've been working over a whole year <laughs> more than a year right yeah jerome yeah on how uh, providing guidance recommendations to the uh, EPA administrator on Justice 40. We have a letter that's going to go with a set of recommendations uh, to the administrator, hopefully in September uh, or maybe October. We met public coming first and then have a- It's more like October. Yeah, October, public mm -hmm. coming first and then and do that. And we actually, the next, uh, we're going to have a, a public meeting the NEJAC is going to be in September, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to have a, a week long meeting of NEJAC in October, mm -hmm. October 28th. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had an in-person NEJAC meeting in, in, in DC in three, in three years, I believe, in three years, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So as part of that work, getting back to the WeJack, so you have those recommendations. We also have our recommendations. So what needs to happen is we have to take those recommendations and make them walk and talk at the state and local level. So uh, organizations, our statewide EJ networks, whether it be North Carolina, South Carolina, right, uh, whether it be our APEN, whether it be uh, CJA in California, Michigan, our, 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 our national coalitions, national environmental justice, uh, black, national black environmental justice network, you know, these different groups, uh, we need to be taking those recommendations at the from the federal level and making them walk and talk on the state level. In our region, that's why, that's why again, for everybody knows, day three is more of a mid-Atlantic focus, just so that y'all know. In our region, we have the Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition, as Kerry talked about. So that coalition working to take those recommendations and making them walk and talk at the state level. So we have to be pushing on what's happening in Delaware, as Kerry's already going to talk more about, pushing what's happening in, in D.C., pushing what's happening in Virginia, and pushing in Maryland, too. And then making sure that we're engaging our county officials, right? So how can we get the, what is the county uh, officers called? What's that name, that association? Um, the MACO? Maryland MACO. Association so, so, so we got to be working through our, Ma our MACOs, too. So MACO, so when you think about, so you got the state networks, right? You got the state <laughs> agencies. But every state, you're, you got to be engaging your MACO. Because your MACO has to do a workaround. Because a lot of times that money gets come down from federal level to state level. It's going to get lost. What about all those block grants from before? They already had a Title VI before. It never got to the community. What, why do we think it's going to be different with this even got a mandate? If the system's not in place, the, the dole off the money's in an equitable way, then that money's not going to get to our communities. So you got to push on MACO to make sure that that money's coming down. I'm going to stop talking, but hopefully that helps the, how you bring it down from the federal to the state down to the county. And, and talk about the rejack idea, too. Oh, yeah. So, again, yeah, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we have these, we got these knee jacks and the wee jacks right. Mm -hmm. Every region, and, and, and it could be, I don't want to have too much um, institutional relation because you can do that across all the federal agencies. But, for example, from the EPA standpoint, we have advocated for every region to have an e -jack. So you can't always go to knee jack, right? Mm -hmm. Logistics and travel, you should have it in your region. And so that's another way to push on your regional administrators. Mm -hmm. We had, was it day one? We had region two represented. Yep. We had region, region three, three represented. Region we had region four. four represented. We had region six represented. That's right. That wasn't by accident, y'all. That was on purpose. So y'all saw those folks who represent the regions. So you have to be pushing on them too. And we actually had a regional administrator, Adam Ortiz, who come come down to go to DC to talk to folks in Brentwood? I think he's been I think he's been to Baltimore, and we and we had a, we've had a couple phone calls. So engage your regional minister as well, it, whether it be the EPA or other federal agencies too, because it's not just the EPA thing. This is all a government thing. So let me yeah. stop. I'm gonna pass the mic back, Bernice, but hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, so I I actually am gonna uh, uh, invite somebody else, um, Adam to uh, Adam Cutler to be a part of this conversation, because here's my concern. Um, my concern is that the places that we are trying to drive these resources to have been in need for decades, for decades. And it is not an accident that the adverse impacts, the things nobody else wants to live with, keep winding up in the same place. That's a function of local government, regional government, and state government signing off on the same impacts again and again and again and again, but also, diverting resources, federal and others, to other places. And so my question, um, Adam, inviting you into this conversation is, what is it that we need to do to change that calculus about who is worthy, right? Because there is really a valuation about our lives and about the worthiness of our communities. And so this money is about to come down. Who was talking earlier? 60 billion. Um, Charles was talking um, 60 billion. There's a hundred billion from EPA's Office of Water. There's 330 billion from the U.S. Department of Transportation for statutory programs that are coming straight to the states, and then another 330 billion in discretionary funding. Mm -hmm. There is money on top of money on top of money. The Department of Transportation has to hire 1,800 additional staff people just to move that money out of that building at the headquarters level. So. It's not about people don't have money. We heard that for decades. Oh, yes. So it's not about a paucity of federal resource, right? But it is about <laughs> the animus that exists within the structures of government about who is worthy and who is not. Adam, I'm not putting this on your shoulders. I'm just saying, what should we do to break that morass? Who was that Adam Cutler. <laughs> I'm a pincher. When this is over, I'm a pincher. In Pennsylvania, I don't mean to flip, but part of the answer is 
changed our legislative uh, majority. But, you know, I think there's a pot of money that goes DEP. DEP has some control over, you know, how it spends its, its discretionary funds that are going to get budgeted. Now, every year there's a fight about how much DEP budget, but be that as it may, you know, one of the things that we've pushed for at the EJAP level to the Secretary, um, and I think, you know, that your back has been responsive, is, you know, you got to include equity principles in, in how you are spending your discretionary funds that you get from the people. All this stuff about, you know, how to use their revenues, their fee-based revenues for the program. But, um, you know, we've done a lot with them on Reggie, we've done a lot with them uh, on, on, you know, policy that is pending right now about, you know, focusing funding, similar to Justice 40, focusing funding to the communities that have historically been pushed out, shut down, forgotten, left behind. Um, the Secretary, uh, Secretary McDonald, who we just uh, recently uh, Resign. Came to the end of his term, basically. <laughs> he came to the end of his term. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lawyer, right? 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 He's a you know, we've got an interim right now. We haven't really, you know, had a chance to really sit down with, with the interim. Um, but, you know, it's going to come down to the election. I said it in the other panel. It's going to come down to November. Who's going to be sitting in that governor's chair and who the, who the secretary of DEP gets, you know, is appointed as? That's going to go a long way in determining how we can move that money to Pennsylvania. But every state's going to be different. Every state has a different situation. I would say that, you know, to the extent have equivalents in each community groups in each state push on their, you know, their departments mm -hmm. or their legislators, mm -hmm. their legislators are receptive. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's where you got to focus the, the effort in my opinion. Well, let, let, me add, let me add one other piece that, you, that Adam, uh, you didn't mention. You know, it's hard to, to correct what you can't measure. Right. Right. So so we, we have uh, pushed the, the Department of Environmental Protection of the state to create a, 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 a model very similar to EJ screen that will have this equitable focus that has this ability for when funding and grant dollars are being allocated throughout the state, that there is an equitable, knowledgeable, repeatable process where citizens can identify what's going on. It's just not going into the back room and you're coming up with these numbers about where these dollars are going to go, but that you do have a portal. And they're actually, we're actually working with uh, uh, EPA, uh, uh, working with Ty, making sure that we have their foundational information, mm -hmm. uploading it into the state. Because, But the state is more granular. Mm -hmm. You have more granular data that will be able to overlay not only what's happening environmentally, but what's happening with public health. So those, those, uh, those uh, portals are being developed. And it's going to enable a more equitable approach. And if nothing else, it's going to give a better profile as to what's happening in the state. And what the additional push should be is to see how funding is being measured as a result of that. Yeah, so, so this is uh, real, uh, 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 real quick. This is every no, no, no. Real quick, moderator. Real quick, real quick, moderator. So we, we Jack has the scorecard. So we had a scorecard session. So y'all should be advocating for a scorecard and this financial tracker. In, in all states. Those are two more things for every state. Scorecard and a financial track. That's all I want to say. Go so ahead. I want to I want to ask Harold and Carrie this question because we know it's a, it's a, it's an extension of the question I, I, I asked Adam. It is um, we know that the fact that these resources have not reached our communities in the past is not just bad policy. It's also a violation of federal civil rights law. And so in this executive order from the president is also a push to step up the implementation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, right? And Title VI of the Civil Rights Act is the sleeping giant of the Civil Rights Act because it says 
you cannot be the recipient of federal financial assistance, loans, tax breaks, direct um, grants, et cetera. However it comes, you cannot be the recipient of federal financial assistance in any form and use that resource in a way that creates discriminatory impact or discriminatory intent against protected groups of people and protected groups, those are the people who were called out in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mm -hmm. And so now the federal government, and we can have a whole nother conference on why we are just having this conference now for an act that was passed in 1964, but we're not gonna go there today. We're just gonna keep it moving forward. But they are rolling out all kinds of guidance about you must meet these requirements. Now, in the documents that they signed today, there's a thing called a performance partnership agreement. And if EPA, that's what EPA does. I don't know what the other agencies do, but if they're gonna send you money to, to implement an environmental program, they sign an agreement, they send you an agreement, it's called you the state, and either the state agency secretary or the governor has to sign this document that says, we are gonna use these resources in the manner in which we intend. It also has a provision that says, and we will be compliant with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand, how many people think that they do that every time they get a dime from the federal government? Raise your hand. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, but now we are gonna see new provision, right? We're gonna see new energy, new enforcement, new effort by the Civil Rights Office. Harold, is that gonna make a difference in South Carolina? It is a trick question. <laughs> Did I also mention that he has an incredible sense of humor and timing, comedic timing? No, but I, I mean, Vernie's I the thing with us here is that, you know, the Justice 40 Oversight Committee piece of legislation that Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter introduced last year mm -hmm. to create this oversight because we saw the train wreck coming. We knew that the kind of like what you just stated, the provisions, and if there's no teeth you know, these folks are gonna do what they want to. And people are talking about money's coming, money was out. The bipartisan infrastructure bill passed back in November, you know, 20, uh, 20, 2021. And we see that even like in North Carolina, once we didn't get the bill passed here, Representative Cobb Hunter, we work with Larry Lambert, got it there in North Carolina, I mean, in uh, Delaware, came back to North Carolina, worked with Senator McKissick to get it passed there as an executive order because it was another red state, but when they got it, they were able to get $900 million in, in transportation funding. Then they got another almost $200 million in from EPA on water. It's someone stated in the room earlier, every state is different. Every local government is different. It's just how we position ourselves to go after these fundings for the problems we see, you know, facing within our communities. Now, there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done because, uh, you know, we see too that even in this money, it's been used to build prisons in Alabama already. Yeah. You know, the governor said what they were going to do there in Alabama. That's you right. know, you got a, a golf course, $3 million was used for a cart path. So the provisions, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. I'm glad is that it's there. I'm glad there are some teeth that are finally being uh, placed in, in, moving forward, especially with uh, the Department of Justice. But when you put money out like that, they're going to do what they want to. Just like our governor said, he knows all the problems that we were able to raise to the table uh, here in South Carolina, but he doesn't care. Justice 40 and Biden, the Biden liberal dollars are not coming into South Carolina. That's mm -hmm. just what we're facing in the deep red South. Yeah, and that's, and, and I'm, I'm so very worried about that. So Carrie, we may not be the deep red South, and <laughs> we often have to argue with our colleagues that we are the South, but we are, and we are South of the Mason-Dixon, and we are the two most Northern slave-holding states, Delaware and Maryland. When Harriet Tubman was bringing in people from freedom, she was bringing them from the Eastern shore of Maryland across the Delaware and, and, and Maryland state line into Pennsylvania, right? So we have to remember our history and remember where we are and the remnants of that system are ever present in our states. Are they not, Carrie? They are. So what are what are we gonna do? Because people tend to think about Maryland and Delaware in particular as kind of politically benign. Mm -hmm. 
right? Even when we have Republican governors, you can't really distinguish the Republican governors from the Democratic governors because they all do the same thing, which is ignore our communities. What do we do differently now, Kerry? The money is going to be flowing. The spigot is open. 166 billion have already been let in infrastructure projects. What are we going to do to interrupt that historic system to make sure that our communities get what they need and what they're entitled to? That's a multi. Um, Take your time. Fascinating <laughs> question, and there's a lot of answers there. First, we have to acknowledge our history, and we have to stop these folks who are trying to keep us from knowing our history and teaching our children our history. Um, and when I say our history, I mean that literally, it's ours. There is no Black history. There is no European history, Indigenous history. It is our history. And if we don't know it in its totality, we are in danger, not just of repeating it, putting it in even a uh, worse off manner than the original sin. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say um, there's a lot of pieces that have to be taken care of. Bernice mentioned 1,800 federal employees have to be uh, hired just to disseminate this historic spending measure. At one agency. At one agency, right? So we have an organization, as we said, Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition, known as MAGIC. Some of us fought Dr. Scobie Wilson on it, but now we all call it MAGIC. The title, right? we did. We, we wasn't feeling MAGIC, but he had to have it that. Is, it is. <laughs> but what we do have now is a program called MAGIC Now. What does that mean? Again, it's a spinoff of this, the name Magic. Um, but now, all of us have been in justice fights. I don't care whether it's strictly environmental justice or if it's education equity or criminal justice or um, healthcare justice, you name it, we've been in justice fights. And it's been long and hard. And some of us just stay in these trenches. And, but we keep telling other people, come on, we need you. And they're like, it's... It's not fun in those trenches, right? You get gangrene down there, right? It's not a place where you want to be. But we keep saying, you're in here with us, you just don't notice it. And if we don't rise up, if we don't stand on each other's shoulders to push each other out and reach back down and pull each other out, we're going to stay right here in these trenches. But some people need a little bit more inspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's where Magic Now comes in. There is this federal funding. And if for this moment they get involved, for this moment they say, this is what I want for my community, and they actually see it taken care of, then maybe they'll get some of that fire we have and want to participate. And when they're trying to imagine what a new community looks like for them, they'll start to see the problems. So when we say there's a systemic problem, and they're like, what's that mean? I don't have time. I work shift work, I have kids, barely keeping my uh, uh, lights on and a roof over my head. They will start to see that problem and hopefully become a part of this thing we call a movement. So with Magic Now, uh, we're piloting it in, we piloted it in Dover, Delaware. Um, not with the lens of Justice 40 necessarily, but just to see if we could get folks involved. But from that, we have people now talking about Justice 40. We have people now realizing why it's so important to say 40% goes to the most impacted communities. Right. We have people realizing how everything is connected and why they must fight harder. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have a program that the people created, that is structured, that we can recreate, each one teach one, and spread throughout the region and then eventually throughout the country is something we can all be proud of. And then we learn things. We learn things like some governing bodies are so corrupted that they don't even believe in themselves. Mm. <laughs> so how can we even start there? But then we have other governing bodies that really have the best intention, but they don't have the know-how. <coughs> and that's a problem, too. If you need 1,800 
people at one federal agency and then you have a group of people who said somebody said run for office make a change you ran and you're like i don't know what to do here we need to be there we need to help create that infrastructure hmm. in the city of dover the capital of the state of delaware we have officials who didn't even know that they could apply for certain things a grant writer that doesn't know how to write for any type of grant except for state level grants this is not the first time there's been federal money that could have gone to cities and and, and counties yeah. it's a big problem but we can solve it and so um and i and i know my brother larry is back there and he can attest and it's good, one thing to vote folks into office, but you have to still stand there when they need you to show up. Exactly. Hold them accountable. Hold them accountable. Yep. Yep. They can write legislation, but they can't whip the votes if you aren't making sure that the people in the community are pushing their own legislator. This is an all hands on deck time. And we can make this change. We're going to constantly uncover changes and issues. The, the beauty of Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition is when we learn in one state, the other state doesn't have to learn on their own. We can say, this is what we found, and they start somewhere ahead of us. And we rejoice in that. We don't, we're don't. we not the crab in the barrel. We're not saying, oh, wait, wait, we haven't paved our way. You do too. We say, don't pave it again. Move forward. And we've had some wins. Our sister state of Maryland um, passed. They codified Justice 40 this last session. We do. Yes, you did. Mid Atlantic Justice Coalition helped. In the, in the with budget. The, yes. In the budget. In the budget. Yes. That. But how? Just saying. Much, hmm. But that that is a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. That is progress. But progress doesn't mean you stop. If anybody has been on a Zoom with me, I have this old looking cassette tape in the back of my um, in in my background, and um, it says. Push pause if you must, but never stop. Hmm. Thank our you. Our opposition never stops. Right. We haven't stopped. I'm going to go to Harold. We just and have to remember our other brothers and sisters doing the same thing. I'm mm -hmm. going to go to Harold and then Jerome and then um, Sokobi. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, a slight little closeout. But <laughs> Harold, what I want to ask you, because Carrie, Carrie mentioned something that I think is so critically important, is how do you inspire people? who have been so left out and so ground down mm -hmm. and so disparately treated. How do you encourage those folks that this is a moment when there can be a different outcome? And Harold, I ask you that because you have done that in Spartanburg, South Carolina. What do we need to do? Because some days, even though there's all this opportunity, I look around and I said, but people hate us. They don't just dislike us. They don't just feel politically opposed to us. They hate us. And so I don't know that I've actually ever lived through a moment like this. And I was alive in the 60s. So how do you find that inspiration, Hal? And how can you pass that on and put it in other people's spirits and hearts so that we can do the work that needs to be done? Well, <clears throat> well Vernice, you, you, you've been here yourself and you've seen Spartanburg. And you saw that we had people within our community that some didn't even make it through high school, but we were able to take that $20,000 small grant and leverage it into 300 million. You know, 20 years ago, we brought Texas Southern and Howard here to help us establish our federally qualified health center that we have uh, 11 sites now in three different counties providing health care for our folks. Um, you know, the housing that people see, all of this came about using the interagency approach you know, 20 years ago, uh, back starting in 2001, there was not the kind of support that you see now with these resources and a president who said, yes, this should happen across the board. We had that when there was absolutely no That's kind right. of support whatsoever. So having all the black engineers, the scientists, the hydrologists, you know, all of the smart people that I've seen at the conference in the last three days there, this coalition that can be put together, you know, as someone just stated in the room, it only takes an example in one place to replicate. This is what they do on the other side. Alec and the Heritage Foundation, they have their think tank that put out stupid stuff every year. What do we put out that could be modeled 
and use and utilize for communities as well as local government. Because a lot of the local government folks, they don't want to get involved because they don't want to open up Pandora's box because they don't have the answers. But the community has the answers. We know what's wrong and we know what's there. And Vernice, you know, here in South Carolina, you know, because of what happened here in Spartanburg, we were able to get that environmental justice bill passed here because they saw the economic impact. And you know who was a co-sponsor on that bill was Nikki Haley right. and Mick Mulvaney, you know, Trump's uh, chief of staff and members of the Freedom Caucus. Yep. They saw the economic impact. And right now we got to start talking more of the economics in our discussion because this environmental justice, social justice, economic justice, climate justice, it's all the same. But we have to fix our narrative and we have to be able to show folks how they can be a part of this. I mean, we're only 1% of this renewable conversation right now. And I'm telling you, timing is everything because come November, the House or the Senate may turn, the spigot shut off. What happens then? And if we don't have the right coalitions in place that can pull and draw these funds down, and I'm talking not only the communities, but we got to hold everybody accountable, including ourselves. And so this is what we're doing. We're not working. The resistance here in South Carolina is why we're taking the team of some of the experts that we've pulled together here in the Regenesis Project in South Carolina, and we're going to other places around the country to help replicate the methodology that we did here mm -hmm. to build not only the local government, but the communities. Uh, Tom Steyer and Kat Taylor, they're helping us, you know, providing the fiscal support for communities because the biggest thing that we have problems with is reporting, compliance, tracking, monitoring, managing the grants. We want to yeah. pull that burden off of the community so that they can do the visioning and look at what they want to see in their communities because lining this up right now, it's more easier now than it was back then. Yep. But we just got to hurry up and get it done. And there are even companies running these like one of our brownfield sites that we have here. We've got a company, uh, Evernew, a garment recycling facility. They wanted to come to this impacted EJ community because they're making a difference in how we uh, you know, dispose of a lot of our garment waste, the 95 million tons that goes into landfills around globally, Chile and Africa more, more so, but they're bringing their facility and putting it here, creating jobs, but where you can take a, a fabric or a coat instead of throwing it away, break it down into a polymer, the polymer becomes another material and you're able to recycle clothes, you know, at least 10 times. And so there are a lot of these companies that are looking and looking in our, you know, the spaces in our communities, but we just have to position ourselves uh, to take advantage of this right now. And time is of the essence. Thank you, Harold. Hmm. Jerome? You know, as, Dr. as Wilson, and then a question. As we're wrapping up, I, I just have to double back because Harold Mitchell always, I'm just, when he goes from that 20,000 to 300 million, like just like, and people just slip that, we need to pause and just let that marinate. And that was before all of these resources were made available. So I, I just wanted to point out that he is absolutely, I'm not impressed with a whole lot of people. My president, they'll tell you, but Harold, and I always yield my time to, to, <laughs> to, to Sokovi, but Harold Mitchell is one of my stars. So, so thanks, Harold. Um, Thank you, sir. You know, but but oftentimes, you know, we, we think about this work, time, work over time matters. And sometimes you have to realize that important things can be done in small measures. And oftentimes some of our work is done measured by inches, not yards. You know, um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Trident Mortgage Company. Heard of Trident Mortgage Company? Well, the Trident Mortgage Company was recently sued by the Attorney General of Pennsylvania and was able to sue them for 80 years of divesture of communities within Pennsylvania. They were making billions of dollars. And when we think about the time, the fact that we are able to come to justice over that course of time should be inspirational in the work that we do. We are talking about, in many cases, historical legacy pollution, less legacy racism, legacy issues of, of contamination. But over time, we call it the community of the willing. The community of the willing will make a difference. 
And I think that it's, it's important for us to make sure that we start lining our efforts up in the short term and the long term so that we don't get to this point where we're having the same conversation again two, three, four, five years from now. Begin to organize our thinking, begin to organize our work, look at these little small gains of catching uh, offenders and abusers and holding them to task and holding them to justice. I think we could do the same thing on this environmental spectrum, but we need to make sure that we measure how people are getting these resources and demand it. Demand it of our political people, demand it of our legislators, and demand it of our administrators as well. So I'm not going to keep belaboring the point, but I think the, the major issue here for us is that we continue to have hope and faith in the fact that doing this right work, this is an honorable and noble work. Yeah, and we yeah. just stay with it. It's a human work. It's a human work. Some people describe it from their personal vestue of someone having someone in their family who might have been poisoned. We had a sister on a panel earlier. She talked about her four children who were poisoned and who had experienced contamination. So she had this more visceral response. <laughs> but all of us are being poisoned. If you think about where we live and ex experiences that we have, but poison is in the dose. So fortunately, we are creating barriers between us and that contamination, us and that ability to be able to get to more work that we need to do. So that's where I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to let that go. And then I'm going to yield my time, which I always do. Please don't yield to any Dr. more time Sokobi to Dr. Sokobi Wilson. To put to put the bow on the on the on the on the present. Doctor yeah. Wilson, where 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 do we need to where do we need to be going? Yeah, thank you for that. So thank you, Jerome. And I will try not to talk too much. Uh feeling that two weeks of two months, five, six months of planning starting to hit me right now. Can't yeah. wait till nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's over with. But yeah, this bit bad, but I am being honest. So so I think where we need to go. I, I think there's some I mean, I think it's two of the words, uh, replication and scalability. Right. So what Harold mentioned, Regenesis Project, I think everybody needs to look at Regenesis. We need to make sure we can replicate that and get that into law, right? So Justice 40 is a constant, constant executive order. It's not the law. You heard about what happened in South Carolina, right? You heard what happened in, in, in Delaware. We got to get these laws passed and then have these constructs, uh, you know, this work embedded so it's this durability. So how we make sure this durability beyond this administration? How can we make sure this durability, you know, when political winds change? I think that's how, and then and the systems we have to get in place. We have some bad systems in place now. So how do we change those systems? And I mean, I don't want to talk too much, and I will probably end up talking too much. But we have time for questions, so we're going to end at 310. So I've already sent the email out. All the sessions at 310. So we got a little bit more time, y'all. Okay. Uh, oh, but we do want to get some questions. Yeah, I, I'm going to stop talking. I got I'm, you, brother. Like another minute, another, another minute or so. Another minute or so. <laughs> but uh, so like, like I was saying, you know, with earlier, replication, scalability, durability, right? Justice 40, make it the law. So every state, we have to have a Justice 40 law. But then what we did in, uh, in Maryland, as Kerry alluded to, we tried to pass a J40 bill. It did not pass. Now, we're a very progressive state, supposedly. I call it a progressive, regressive state. We're progressive in talk, regressive in action. That's right. In, in, in Maryland, right? That's we right. We got a lot of folks with a lot of power. That's now, right. Now, we did have a legislative session the other day, and we had Senator Gopinski talked about the Climate Solution Act that passed like, the fourth, the fourth time, right? We had uh, a delegate, Chuck Udian, and, and delegate, Fraser Hidalgo, who've been trying to pass some energy bills in our state. So that's some opportunities around the energy bills, right? So energy justice, energy equity. But I think we have to, what we did, as Carrie mentioned, with the Justice 40 didn't pass, we've got the language in the bill. So 40% of any dollars, in our, any, do, any vulnerability dollars from federal state sources have to go to the disadvantaged communities. That's in the budget. We have to fight for that every year. So get it in the statute, get it in the budget, change the systems, our state revolving funds. We got to get the right people. Yes. no systems. Yes. So much, the, the animus, the apathy, the race. The, how are you going to address about racism? We got racist funding systems. Right. Right. Re regardless of red state or blue state, you, you know, uh, 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 whatever color, purple, green, that's part of the problem. So we had to change those systems. And I mentioned this idea of scorecards, scorecards and tracking. Jerome mentioned it. Uh, that Ty Lung, because with the EPA developed the EJ screen, there's a financial tracker. Tra track every dollar. Where's it going to? Who's getting the money? How the money's being used? And the, and the ROI, return on investment, right? Yeah, so we got to see that. And that has to be pushing the law. And the last thing, the accountability. You know, we have this accountability for everybody. We have election coming up. Get the right people in. But as you said, as somebody said, or as I said, no politician goes to politician school. 
<laughs> right? Would y'all wait four years to evaluate me? If I, if you, if you didn't hire me, no, you won't wait no four years. Why we do that? Or two years? You should be evaluating folks that from day one. So have an agenda, hold them to your day four agenda, and make sure they implement your agenda. So we have a multi pronged approach, but I'll, I'll stop there. But those are my recommendations for these. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank I'm you. A, I'm a professor. <laughs> 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 Introduce yourself. My name is Joe James. I want to say hi to Harold. Joe. I, I live day to day in South Carolina. But I hey, also Joe. served as the president of the Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation for six years. Yes. Here in Maryland. I'm an economic developer. I got into that business because if you don't have the economic wherewithal, you're not free. What's missing, it was almost coming out, but what's missing in this strategy is the economic component. How do we create businesses? How do we create jobs? How do we commercialize new technologies that can deal with climate change, environmental remediation? How do we create a bioeconomy? And, and I hope that you will include that in your, in your strategy, because what's happening now in the, the new bill, the carbon capture funding is for technologies that can never benefit our community. That's right. Okay? That's so right. I'm involved with a an agricultural process, but and I'll talk about it later this afternoon, by which we use crops to capture lots of CO2, but those very same crops can pull toxins out of brownfield sites. Yeah. And then at the end of it, you can harvest them and turn that material into bioproducts, creating jobs in the very same communities that you've just enhanced. So without the economic component, without saying that MBDA and minority business programs and economic development programs that create jobs in the communities need to be part of this strategy, we're going to miss the boat. Excellent and, point. And, and respond to that. So no, yeah. you can't respond to what? that. We need time for more questions because okay, go ahead. we go because we're going to sum we're going to sum up we're going to sum up right where Joe left. I want other people to ask questions, and we're going to come right back. Marva. Joe, what, are you on a panel? Out? Are you on a panel this afternoon? It's a, it's a <laughs> social impact entrepreneurship panel with, with, with Meta and involved. Yeah, because it's funded. The program is almost funded by Meta. Other questions? I see you, Leanne. Leanne. Yes. Um, so first of all, I want to thank our panelists, some of whom are from my home my home state. I'm Leanne Nurse. Um, I've been 31 and a half years in EPA. Started out in Region 3 and worked with many of the people in this meeting. So it's really a precious thing for me to be able to be here. I left EPA in 2021, came to Nature Conservancy as a senior policy advisor for DEIJ. Going back into the weeds about the NEAT Act and the development of tracking methodology. So you guys talking to the Environmental Finance Advisory Board and the Finance Centers because they already have the tools, they have the systems, especially for um, revolving funds and other infrastructure bills. I'm hoping that means you don't have to do the same work twice. And then at the regional level, once you've established structure in the states, the office of the federal executive, so that you have regional contact, not just with the AEJ staff, but the other federal agencies, all of whom will be held accountable under 14008 both for their infrastructure money for IRA and for racial justice progress. So those are just two things that I want to throw thank out. You want to chime in first? Thank you, Leanne. Yeah, thank you. And it seems uh, from my, my former home state, Pennsylvania. From my home, home neighborhood. A neighborhood. We, we, <laughs> know, we, we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jerome. Ask me a question. Come on now. <laughs> the, the clock is running. The clock is running. <laughs> No, I, yes, we, we, we did. And so oh, okay. we, we made those requests. We had those, those conversations. Yeah. And so as Kobe, uh, so Kobe ind indicated when we uh, first started the today, there is a list of requests that we're making around the process for how funds, and it's actually a cradle to grave model in our thinking. Mm -hmm. 
right? From the allocation to where, what's the return on investment, who's getting, and, and be able to track and chart. So and you should so, be able to get support from ICMA and the local government groups. Yeah, well, yeah. So that's a, that's a different kind of that's a different approach. Yeah, right. Um, our working group is very targeted to to EPA. And then, real quickly, to add, in Maryland, we did uh, collaborate with the EF, Environmental Finance Center on two EFC proposals for Region Three. But I think if you look traditionally at the EFCs, they haven't been doing environmental justice and equity work. That's why. I'm so that's so that's. It's a good, it's a good time, but it, but it creates. It, it, it talking about the system needs to be changed. That's another that's one part of the, of the problem. That yep. EFCs who have been doing EJ work have been part of the problem. So we have to make sure we hold them accountable, okay. accountable yeah. too. Yeah. Carrie. Okay. Oh, sorry. Are we uh, sort of. Yes. Kind of, sort of. Okay. Uh, Mr. Joe, I apologize. My colleagues in the back are probably gonna get upset with me, but Mid Atlantic Justice Coalition. We function at the intersection of economic and environmental justice um, and understanding that while we're fighting bad, bad neighbors and corporations, uh, we also have to talk about what is our yes? What are we willing to bring into our communities to make sure we're all growing? Um, and not just that, it's hard to tell someone who works in an oil refinery that um, we're just shutting you down when that's how they've paid their bills. You know, uh, President Biden once said, I'm not going to end fra fracking. This is before he's president. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to end fracking. People love fracking. And I remember I was upset and I was thinking, nobody loves fracking. They love putting food on the table and knowing that their child will never have to possibly do that job because there's enough money to send them off to college or somewhere else. If you can find an industry that allows them to have that same sense, they will gladly go because they know they are also sacrificing their lives, their neighbors' lives, and even their children's lives. And so what is that answer? And I think it is really important that those of us in this room sit together and figure out together what are our yeses? Because we're often known as the people who say no. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't bring a lot of people on board with us. And so um, I, I want to close with that and saying, let's come together, figure out our yeses um, so that People only don't just see us as no, but the way forward. Carol, you have any final thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I'm kind of sitting here listening to Joe James and Dr. Jacoby Wilson, two South Carolinians. You know, why they didn't tell me about the escaping going north to Maryland? I mean, I missed. <laughs> you know, some somehow I missed the freedom train. Anything else, anything else, Carol? Yeah, I want to, I mean, Vernice, I want to thank you, though, because you've been in this movement for some time, and Shakobi, uh, and especially Marva, and it's gatherings like this and being able to bring folks together to learn what folks are doing in other spaces so that we can, you know, broaden our mindset as far as how we're thinking and looking at this. This is totally different, and what Joe James stated that was my point on the economics of this. We're talking about a renewable revolution that's about to take place. These electric charging stations, all of these things that we see this coming, you know, where are we in this conversation? You know, what are we building? You know, what's in our community? Why can't we be a part of this whole conversation that we're only 1% of right now? And how do we move that forward? Especially when you look at the Department of Education and you know, some of these other agencies that we don't pay attention to, that the funding's on the table to help teach and train our young folks to be prepared for this in the future. So thank you, uh, Dr. Wilson, Staff, and everybody who pulled this together, man. I applaud you and thank you for helping us uh, to see bigger and brighter. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we are wrapping up and I want to say um, that Joe said something so incredibly important about the need to, and I think um, I think uh, Reverend Yearwood said it in his remarks um, during lunch as well, the need to break out of the constraints that we place on ourselves about who we're working with, who we're talking to, who we're doing this imagining with, right? This is a different moment. And, and, and Harold is right, I've been working on this for a long time, but the, the stars have not aligned. 
and the universe has not spoken the way it is speaking right now. But we can't just be talking to each other, right? So there are people who have for decades, as long as we've been working on EJ, that have been people working on community development on the finance side of how you track resources and steer those resources, how you hold banks and financial institutions accountable. Um, there is a there is a battle going on, first of all, about the reauthorization of the commu National Community Reinvestment Act. We need to be paying attention to that, right? Because that is a component of this conversation, although we are not talking about it on the EJ side. The community development people have been throwing down about that for a year, right? And that's about to come to a head. It will also affect how these resources are going to flow. We have got to be in partnership and in conversation with the folks who are working on community development, economic development, community finance institutions. So there is a battle that's going to go on about that bill that was signed yesterday about whether or not community development finance um, institutions, right, the community development banks, the CDCs are going to be able to access some of this federal money. If they're going to be the ones that that money is going to be deposited in, and then they drive that money into communities. Right now, they're locked out of that process. So they're trying to battle that out with the reauthorization of the National Community Reinvestment Act. They have to be a part of this conversation. The folks who are working strictly on public health, right, they need to be a part of this conversation. Our colleagues who are working in the mainstream environmental community, some of them are with us and some of them are not. After yesterday, we could have had bloodletting in the streets of, of D.C. yesterday after that bill went down. It's both a good thing and it's a god-awful thing. There's some really awful things in that bill, right? And none of us should have let it slide. None of us should have let it slide. But should that stop us from working together in this incredible moment of opportunity? It should not. It should not. My, my family don't always do what I want them to do. Hell, they don't never do what I want them to do. I don't care how many times I tell them, do it like this. They do it the other way. So now I tell them to do it the other way so they can do it the way I want them to do it, right? <laughs> if my own relatives won't get on the same page with me, then I can't expect people who are not in the space that I'm in to get on the same page with me. This is a moment of incredible opportunity. We have got to reach beyond ourselves. We've got to reach out to people that we've not worked with before. Even people that we might have thought were not necessarily aligned with us. There are a lot of people in the private sector who are trying to figure out what can we do? How can we be a part of this? And Harold's got a lot of, a lot of recommendations. Joe, I bet you know about a lot of folks who've been trying to figure out where is their space in this conversation. There is so much money on the table, so much money. Nobody will ever be able to say again after this money starts flowing that there is not enough money to reach your communities. That's done. That's over. But how are we going to get that money in our communities? How are we going to leverage that money in our communities? And how are we going to make sure that it's spent in the ways that can change people's lives, that can restore justice, that can undo these environmental assaults? How can we do that? That's the moment that we're at. And all of us are going to have to grow bigger, stand taller, stand around tables that we've not stood at before to get this done. On behalf of all the people who are coming behind us, if we don't do this now, all of us need to hang up our shingles. All of us. Because this is unprecedented opportunity. This is going to be a fight. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to have to fight for every inch that we make in progress. But this is the, if ever there was a moment to do this work, this is this moment. But we can't do it by ourselves. Too much money, too much power, too much influence, too much politics. And it's kind of crazy out here. Have you noticed? Yeah. Right? So we're trying to make progress in a really difficult political environment. But progress is going to be made because we have the capacity to do it. And you hear these people here, right? So you, you should have confidence that they're going to take care of business where they are. And now it's up to us to take care of business wherever we are. Thank you for a great panel.